uh, surfaces or uh, manifolds. So now we have this Ronald transform uh, in this parameterization here. So we, uh, we have the, uh, for each angle phi, you have this vector of theta here, and then you integrate your F along this uh, lines on this, uh, uh, with the distance S to the origin. So, and then you will have this Ronald transform. It's a very standard uh, 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 parameterization. So now for the, uh, for the Ronald transform, it's well known that there is this uh, filter back projection formula, right? So you apply, uh, you, you get your Ronald transform and then you apply this uh, uh, I inverse, which is the, uh, the raised potential. And then you apply this R star, which is the adjoint of the Ronald transform. And then you will get F back uh, and multiply by one over four pi and then you get F back. So this is the uh, reconstruction formula that you used uh, uh, in the uh, many applications. So therefore, if uh, in, uh, so for this formula, right? So you need to assume that, uh, you know, in, in order for this formula to work, you need to take this uh, uh, RF to be, you need, you need to take your data P, this actual data to be the uh, random transform. And therefore in practice, this works well if your uh, uh, actual data is actually belong to the range of the, uh, of the random transform. So now, but in many cases, the uh, actual the actual data you get is actually not in the range of the Ronald transform. So this is the uh, artifact phenomenon, streaking artifact phenomena. Uh, it's very common uh, in this uh, dental image. So because uh, so in, for example, in CT scan containing metal objects, this data is not in the range of Ronald transform. And the reason for uh, for that, I, I'm going to explain uh, in a minute. But if you look at the, so this is an image that I, if you Google this, you know, you will find many uh, images like this. And I just take one from, from the webpage, from Google. And uh, so this is a typical dental image for a patient with um, metal implants. So these two white spots here are the, the metal implants. And then um, if you apply the uh, FBP, for example, the filter back projection directly to the, uh, to the, uh, Actually, data you will get this image with this uh, straight lines. Uh, you can see all the striking artifacts uh, here, and then also uh, in particular, you can see that this uh, there's some bright this uh, uh, bright and dark straight uh, striking artifacts from these two Y spots, and uh, so and the uh, so this uh, artifacts uh, this is very common uh, in the in this kind of imaging uh, applications, and also. Uh, it's very common in the uh, non-destructive imaging, like you, you wanna see the interior of the engine, which is constructed by, uh, by metal. And then, uh, so uh, and in, the, in those images, you also see this uh, and even more severe uh, artifacts, straight artifacts here. So now the, um, so this artifacts, as you can see, the strongest artifacts are around these two uh, metal uh, implants here. And there's a reason why this thing would surround the, uh, uh, the, the artifacts are, you know, are all around these objects. And uh, uh, you know, we'll, I will explain you know, how these things are related to geometry of these objects. So now several causes has been identified to account for such at artifacts. And there's a good review paper by Barrett and Keith. And uh, so now for us, I, I will be mainly consider the beam hardening effects. And this, uh, in this beam hardening effects, you will consider the case that the attenuation coefficient of the metal objects actually varies largely with respect to the energy level E of the X-ray. So, so this thing uh, is the following, right? So you start, uh, you, you wanna do this X-ray um, image, uh, X-ray CT, right? So the, ideally the X-ray you send will be, uh, folk, it will be, focused on, uh, on energy level, say E0 here. And then, uh, how, and then uh, the, uh, your attenuation coefficient, uh, you know, for the fixed energy level E0, then uh, your, uh, you will just need to recover the attenuation coefficient for that energy level E0. But in reality, uh, because the uh, X-rays are not really focused on the, uh, it's a, the energy is a distribution around E0, so they're really uh, not uh, at this E0 energy level. So therefore, uh, this, uh, if your attenuation coefficient, such like a metal, they vary largely with, risk, with, with respect to this energy level E, then uh, the, uh, the uh, so, so then the, uh, you're not really getting the F at E0, but you're getting a sort of a distribution of F around E0. And this will cause the, uh, uh, this will cause that the, uh, the X-ray data is not really in the, um, in the 
a range of random transform. They cannot be uh, models purely on the solely on the random transform. So for for such effects, you know, here I consider the beam hardening effects, but also the uh, uh, the so-called Crompton scattering will also cause the uh, dissipation of the energy. And uh, for in that case, um, you would also have the uh, the similar artifact uh, phenomena. So now we will consider the mathematical model as following. Okay, so let D be a region of metal objects and let chi D be the characteristic function of these metal objects. And now we will, we will assume that the energy level E is in an energy window E0 minus epsilon to E0 plus epsilon for some epsilon bigger than zero. So basically this is the energy level E and it's around, you know, it's a distribution around this E0. And then uh, you look at the attenuation coefficient Fe, this is the uh, thing we want to, to image. And then, uh, so this Fe can be written as, uh, you, you think that this F is actually a function of the energy E, and then you can write Fe uh, equal to Fe zero plus a, an additional term, this alpha times E minus E zero times chi D. So this additional term is actually, uh, you can think that this alpha is an approximation of the derivative dFe, uh, dE. So this is part of the derivative in, of Fe in E, because here F depends on E. Now, if uh, for many tissues, uh, for, for human tissues, this attenuation coefficient actually does not vary a lot with respect to the energy level, then this alpha is very small, close to zero. So you don't have this additional term. And therefore you would just have the, uh, uh, this Fe zero here. But uh, for metal object, this term uh, cannot be uh, overlooked. So we have this alpha times uh, this uh, additional term here. So now, so this is the uh, attenuation coefficient. Now, so for this beam hardening effects, you can derive from the uh, physics, it's Beer-Lambert law, that uh, now uh, you, derive, uh, you, you can derive that the actual data is equal to the random transform of Fe zero plus an additional term. So of course, this additional term comes from the, uh, this additional term in the attenuation coefficient. And then uh, this additional term uh, is a nonlinear function of the random transform of the uh, characteristic function of the metal object. So for, to derive this model, uh, you need to start with the physics and then you need to make a certain assumptions for this beam hardening effects. So in general, uh, in, in many literatures, actually this, uh, uh, this additional term PMA, this metal artifact term, this term is just not, you know, people uh, could assume that this term is just a nonlinear function of the, uh, uh, this uh, RFE zero or R uh, chi D. So, so in general, there could be a nonlinear function here, not necessarily the, uh, this one, but this one is for the beam hardening effects. So now if you look at the, uh, if you take the, if you look at this uh, actual data P as phi, and then you apply the filter by projection formula, then you will get the uh, first term, you will get FE zero. Okay, this is the uh, thing that we want to, to see. And then you have this additional term FMAX. So this FMA is just the application of the field back, filter back projection to this nonlinear function here. Now this term, uh, it turns out that this term would appear, uh, would you know, contain the uh, the metal, the straight artifacts that we see in the uh, reconstructed image. So, um, so yeah, and uh, yeah. So therefore, let's let me see. Okay, yeah. So this term actually accounts for that uh, metal artifacts. So now our goal is, of course, to look at the, um, to give a mathematical description of the artifacts and to analyze what, uh, when these artifacts would appear and what is the, uh, uh, and what's the relation to the geometry of the metal um, uh, object. So now the characterization of the metal artifacts was introduced in uh, Park, Troy, and Cell in, the, in their uh, 2017 paper. They use this micro, uh, they, they use a micro local um, analysis notions reference set to uh, describe this uh, metal artifacts. So there, uh, if you look at this uh, uh, metal artifact, this uh, straight artifacts around in, in this image, right? You can think that your uh, image, your attenuation coefficient f e or uh, this r uh, or this chi d, right? So it's um it's a function. Uh, is a function, and then these lines are where this uh, uh, attenuation uh, coefficient has a jump type singularity, right? So this is the uh, where you would have singularity, and uh, these lines are the actually the singular support, and also uh, and but uh, in 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 this paper uh, by Troy, a uh, Park Troy and Cell, they use this uh, uh, wavefront set that also tells you the direction of the uh, uh, singularity. 
So they have they come up with this following uh, definition. So uh, this uh, L phi s, you know, the phi and the s are used to prime trans to transform. And uh, for this phi and s, you uh, have this line. You, you consider this line here, uh, and uh, this line is a streaking artifacts of the FCT. So FCT is this uh, uh, reconstructed uh, uh, function. So this is a streaking artifact in a sense of wavefront set if the wavefront set of this function at this point x is not empty for x on this line minus the support of Fe0. So basically it just says that uh, if this line, uh, you, you have this, uh, this line's artifacts that means at this point, at any point of this on this line, your function would be uh, singular, right? So this FCT would be singular there. So, and actually, uh, because you do not consider the singular support of FE zero, that means the uh, singularity is only uh, coming from this uh, FMA term, Mal artifact term. So now this is the, they give this definition, mathematical definition, and then they uh, prove a theorem that shows that they'll give a characterization when this artifacts would appear. So they show that uh, if a line is a stringing artifacts of uh, FCT in the sense of wavefront set, then it must satisfy that the, uh, the wavefront set of uh, this uh, arc ID. So this is the random transform of the characteristic function of the metal object. So if this wavefront set at this point phi s has dimension two. So you see, once you determine this uh, phi and s, you can go back and find this line and locate where this uh, uh, streaking artifact will be, okay? So, now this, uh, for, for this result, they, would just, uh, they need to assume that this object uh, must be uh, strictly uh, convex. But, uh, uh, but anyway, so let me uh, show you how this thing is, um, why, why this uh, condition would imply the, uh, uh, why the existence of this streaking artifact is related to the dimension of the wavefront set here in, the, uh, in this arc ID, which is in the sinogram, right? So now this is a picture uh, from, from their paper. So suppose you have this two metal objects in the D1 and D2, these are the uh, 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 strictly, these are the two objects with a strictly convex uh, boundary. And then you look at this Rowland transform uh, on this uh, picture on the right. So now, because you now here you consider characteristic function chi D, right? So you have a, uh, so now here you have a characteristic function which is singular at the boundary uh, uh, on this D1 and D2. Now you look at the sinogram and you will get all this four curves, right? So one, two, three, four, you know, kind of four curves. And this is actually the arc ID. So now if you look at the arc ID, you can see that this function is actually uh, singular uh, along this uh, four curves. Now in general, if you look at like a point of, uh, look at this uh, yellow point here, and then at this point, the, uh, uh, this arc ID actually is singular in one direction. So it's uh, only uh, singular in the normal direction to the curve. And for this point, actually it corresponds to a line, this yellow line here, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, at, uh, which touches the boundary at this uh, D2, uh, you know, in the, for this D2. Now for all the other points, uh, this red or blue point on this, uh, on this curve, you also have these lines. Okay, however, they're just uh, touching uh, one of the object. This is uh, the point where the dimension of uh, our, the wavefront set at this point is only one, right? So this is only one, it's, the, it's only singular in the normal direction. Now there are four special point here. So this orange point, for example. Now, if you look at the orange point, then the uh, arc ID will be singular in two, di in two uh, directions. One is uh, normal, uh, normal to, you know, normal to, uh, to these two curves. So this is the dimension, the dimension of the wavefront set will be two at this point. Now this point, if you, uh, this point will correspond to a line, to the orange line here, which is tangent to this two uh, strictly convex object. So therefore they conclude that for strictly convex object, you know, the artifacts would appear as the tangent line to, uh, to these two objects. So actually for these two objects, there will be four tangent lines and uh, each, each of this tangent line will correspond to this, uh, uh, this point, uh, this four point, corner point. Okay, so this is the uh, macro-local uh, description of this uh, metal artifacts in, uh, uh, in this work of Park Choi and Cell. So uh, now the, uh, so this is their uh, result. Uh, however, you know, uh, we noticed that, you know, this result is not very, uh, you know, uh, 
precise in the sense that they have very uh, good uh, assumption on the geometry and also your function here just calculates the function. So therefore, and also they, uh, you have a, actually you have a nonlinear function here, but this nonlinearity is not um, really uh, used uh, uh, thoroughly in their analysis. So therefore we will, um, we will uh, give a more precise analysis of the artifacts, in particular the, the singularities in this nonlinear term and how the singularities are, are uh, reflected in this reconstructed image. So therefore our result, uh, we'll use a, uh, a fair, uh, we use the macroroco method to um, uh, get the following results. First, away from the boundaries of the metal objects, we will uh, characterize the uh, streaking artifacts at conormal distributions and we determine their strengths. So uh, we already see, uh, uh, saw this in uh, Gunther's talk uh, about this conormal distribution. So uh, that's very good. And then, uh, but here, you know, uh, by our, from our analysis, we can actually determine the, uh, the strength, the order of the distribution It's very uh, precise. And then uh, for different geometry uh, from the convex objects or non-convex objects, we can determine all the possible artifacts and um, so this will be the upper bound on the on the wavefront center with singular support. And then uh, for some applications, based on the precise analysis, uh, we can um, construct. You know, our analysis leads to a uh, to a construction of appropriate filters, which will uh, help to reduce the uh, artifacts. We basically, we can reduce the order of the artifacts. So finally, this is some uh, ongoing work is that our analysis also unboxes the nonlinear interactions, which could potentially lead to the, uh, to use to determine the nonlinear function, this PMA. So like I mentioned, uh, so, so this nonlinear, this particular nonlinear function is derived for the beam hardening effects, but in general, you could have a nonlinear function that is non-non. And they, uh, what, so the, the way to reduce the uh, artifacts is that uh, one way to reduce the artifacts is that suppose you have, you know this function and first you can determine this uh, uh, location of the metal objects and then you can subtract this term from the uh, actual data to get RFE zero and then you get the reconstruct, you get a better image. So now in the case when this function is not known, then uh, it's an uh, interesting question to, uh, to, to see if you can find this nonlinear function from the uh, artifacts. And this actually in line with the, the other talks uh, in this uh, workshop is that by looking at the nonlinear action of the singularities, you can tell something about this nonlinear function. And actually we're uh, thinking in that direction to see if we can find this, uh, uh, at least some, some information in this nonlinear function. All right, so now uh, let me uh, mention a few words about the, uh, the connection to the, uh, uh, there's another similar artifact phenomena in this uh, attenuated X-ray tomography. So uh, here, uh, uh, this is a very simple model and I would just wanna show where this nonlinearity would appear and how, do we, uh, how, how can we handle that. So we'll consider the attenuated X-ray transform on R2 uh, using the following uh, parameterization. So, um, here you have this XAF, this A is the attenuation coefficient, F is still the, uh, 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 the function to be imaged. And then you have the following transform for F. So you have this E to the minus BA, and then you have this uh, F here. So this uh, 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 BA is a integral transform of this uh, attenuation coefficient A. And then you have this e to the minus b a term. This is a, a nonlinear function here, and then it's multiplied by f. So this is the uh, x a uh, f. This attenuated actual transform it has applications in um, uh, aspect, for example. So uh, now the if you look at this, uh, uh, so there are many interesting problems for for this uh, uh, attenuated actual transform. And it's known that it's not always possible to recover all the uh, you know to recover. Um, both A and F, it's not always possible to simultaneously determine A. If you know A, uh, you can determine F. Uh, so there's a work by Stefanov. But uh, so now the question that uh, seems interesting to us is that, uh, uh, is it possible to determine the uh, singularities in attenuation coefficient, the source term, uh, when you have, when they have the conormal type singularities? So uh, that means, uh, so you assume that, for example, if A and F are uh, piecewise smooth and then, uh, or piecewise constant function, can you find the uh, singular support? And actually there's a recent work by Homer and Richardson uh, that for Euclidean case, if A is piecewise constant and under certain uh, assumptions, both A and F can be uh, uniquely determined. So now the, um, 
And now uh, I would like to look at this, uh, uh, this work by Kasvich in 1999. So Kasvich studied the local tomography problem with Nelson's attenuation coefficient. So uh, mo many of the work, they assume the attenuation coefficient A is smooth, but he looked at this problem for Nelson's coefficient, uh, attenuation coefficient. And uh, uh, so I, he proved a very long theorem, but I will just consider a very simple case here. So uh, we, we consider A, which is piecewise smooth, and gamma is the single support of A. And then we consider local tomography function defined by, the, uh, by this formula here. So, so this is the, uh, very similar to the filter by projection formula, but you, here you have a, a, the uh, attenuating actually transform and you apply the second derivative in P variable and then you apply the uh, uh, back, you know, you apply this uh, adjoint back projection. So now you get this uh, F tilde, which is the local tomography. This is not exact construction, but it's a, a kind of local tomography function. So now the, uh, and then Kasvich studied, you know, what uh, kind of singularity can you get uh, in this, uh, in this F tilde. So now if suppose D is the support of F and S is the singular support of F, under some geometric assumptions on the, uh, under some ge geometric assumptions, Kasvich proved that the singular support of F tilde is uh, contained in S, which is the singular support of F. Uh, and union gamma D, this is a part of the uh, singular support of A, and then union this uh, uh, LJ, this LJ are actually lines, these are the, actually the artifacts. So these are the lines tangent to uh, gamma and uh, S union gamma. So you could have uh, this lines tangent to uh, two pieces of uh, gamma, which is the uh, singular support of the attenuation coefficient, or it will be tangent to the uh, gamma and S, which is the singular support of F. So now the, uh, actually our analysis would apply to this case and we can, uh, it's possible to give a uh, precise statement on the, uh, on this artifacts. Because if you look at this uh, reconstruction formula here, if you compare this with the, uh, with the uh, 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 filter back projection, right? So the, this operator here is a, a pseudo mesh operator. And then here you get a R star, which is FIO. So the, uh, on the macro local level, these two operators are, are the same as the uh, FBP. And now for this XAF, you can see that if you assume A and uh, F have conormal singularities, then uh, this BA uh, has singularities. You know, you can analyze singularity from the singular transform. And then you have the nonlinear function here, and then this singularity starts to interact with the singularity in F. And of course, you know, in, in A, this term it will have a uh, interaction with singularity, but all the singularity will get uh, 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 will start to interact with each other. And you can exactly see that the uh, the, uh, the possible artifacts here will be either tangent to gamma or uh, to, or, or to gamma and s. So uh, you know this is one uh, possible application of our analysis. Where we uh, um, yeah. So we and also another another part of, uh, uh, for for this uh, problem is that here you only have the upper bound on the singular support. And it's interesting to see if you can get the lower bound on the singular support. And for that, it's, uh, it seems possible to, uh, to look at this uh, nonlinear function here and look at the, you know, if you can really get the singularities, you can uh, recover the singularities of that A and F from here. So this is actually uh, some ongoing work. Okay, so now that's the, uh, uh, the problem. So now let me, um, uh, explain how do we get this? Uh, uh, how do we get the precise result using this microlocal method? So for the uh, so I will start with the convex objects, and uh, uh, so for the convex objects, uh, the uh, it's a little bit easier. And uh, for the analysis of singularities, we can use basically the conormal distribution and also the Lagrangian distribution, as we have uh, seen in uh, Gunther's talk. And then for the non-convex objects, we, we have to go beyond and use a more complicated distribution space and adapt it to the geometry. Okay? So now I will briefly, you know, let me uh, briefly go over this uh, convex object case. So uh, for the strictly convex metal objects, we assume that the metal uh, region is the union of this DJ, which are, uh, each of them are simply connected and uh, the boundary are strictly convex smooth curves. And then, um, so now uh, for the first part, I will work with an approximation of this nonlinear function. So basically I will work with the polynomial expansion of the term instead of the full nonlinear function. So uh, in particular, 
I will look at the, uh, for the first part, I will look at only the first term in this expansion. So that's the uh, quadratic term, this R chi D square. And so I'll look at the, uh, uh, this first term. Because you know the analysis of this term, the singularity in this term already indicates uh, how the uh, the higher order terms would be. Uh, 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 so it already indicates the main ingredients. So now let's look at the uh, this uh, uh, this term. Okay, so here you have this uh, arc ID square, and then you apply the uh, filter band projection. So now for, uh, now we start with the, uh, this R chi D term. So now here chi D is the, uh, because D is a union of all this D J and each chi D is actually characteristic function. It has a heavy side type singularity, this conormal distribution. So therefore you have this, uh, you can uh, find that this chi D is uh, I minus one uh, and conormal to this boundary of D which is sigma J. So this is all very nice, you know, I've, uh, well, we're all seen this uh, uh, notion in uh, Gunther's talk, so I don't have to do that. And then now you consider this arc ID. So now this R is actually this random transform can be uh, 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 thought of as a elliptic uh, free radical operator. And then under the uh, convexity assumption, you can show that this arc ID is a normal distribution to uh, of this order to this SJ. So this SJ are some uh, one dimension, you know, are some uh, one dimension, some manifold of uh, of M. So here uh, the uh, so this can be done by uh, under the uh, convexity assumption. You need to assume this uh, uh, D DJ. They are all strictly convex uh, metal objects, and then. So, uh, so now the, uh, what, uh, so this SJ and can be computed explicitly, but let me show you the, uh, the picture here. So basically if you have a, you know, this object DJ and you have a chi D here, they are, sing they are normal to the Sigma J. And then uh, when you trust, you know, when you look at this uh, image in this R chi D in the sonogram, then you have all these curves S J. So this is this curve is not exactly the same as uh, uh, in reality, but uh, schematically you will get uh, these curves. Each one, this S J correspond to this uh, sigma J, and they have S K corresponding to the sigma K, and then these curves will uh, you know will appear uh, in the um, in a sinogram, and your function R chi D will be a conormal distribution to to these curves. Okay. So now the, for the metal, uh, for the analysis of the metal artifacts in this scenario, uh, it's not actually very difficult. So you, you look at this R chi D square, you expand it. Uh, suppose you have multiple uh, metal objects, then you would have uh, the first term is R chi D I, you know, this uh, self uh, product. And then you have the two times this R chi D I times R chi D J. So these are, you know, this is, these are for two different metal objects. So if you have a, just the one metal objects, you wouldn't have this term. You just have the first term here. So now the thing is that the, the singularities in these two terms are different. So the first uh, for this R chi D I square, you can show that uh, this, uh, because R chi D I is a, a conormal uh, distribution. So the uh, product is, is belong to the same conormal distribution space. And uh, so this can be uh, also seen from Pirot's result on the, uh, on the, um, a product of uh, uh, conormal distributions. And uh, so therefore, in particular, this term does not generate new singularities. All the singularities are still conormal to the curve SJ. However, the second term is R chi DI and R chi DJ. So this term involves the multiplication of two conormal distributions. And you need to look at how this SI, the singular support uh, uh, intersect. So under the, um, under the strictly convexity assumption, the, uh, you can see that uh, this SI and SJ, they must intersect transversely. This is very important for the analysis of the singularity in this term. So now if under that uh, uh, convexity assumption, this two, this two curves, SJ, SK intersect transver transversely at a finite many uh, points, exactly like this, they intersect transversely. And for each P in the intersection, uh, there is a straight line tangent to both the uh, uh, to two uh, objects dj and dk. So these are the uh, you know, the the relation of the intersection point and the uh, the lines that are tangent to uh, to these objects. So now uh, so now uh, under this uh, uh, in, uh, transversal intersection 
uh, case, we can use the results of a green infant woman, and uh, therefore the product archive DI and archive DJ are actually belong to the uh, class of uh, uh, pair Lagrangian distribution uh, uh, talk, uh, as talked by uh, uh, Gunther. So now, and we can find the order for this intersection. Actually, for this two pro for this uh, product, you can e you can even find the uh, principal symbols of this uh, uh, this term on each Lagrangian, and you can show that they are actually not vanishing. So therefore, now the last step is now we have we know the singularities in this uh, in this product, and then we can uh, apply the uh, filter back projection to see how this uh, singularities would appear in the reconstructed image. And therefore, you know, uh, you, you can see there are two, there are three Lagrangians here. This is n star p is uh, this p is intersection of s i s j. So at this point, the Lagrangian would have a. a to, I mean, the, uh, at, at this point, the uh, Lagrangian uh, at, this, at that point has dimension two and N star SI and N star SJ. So at this two points, you know, the, uh, in the, uh, uh, so it, the uh, covector has only one dimension. So therefore this P would uh, translate back to the, uh, uh, to the string artifacts in the reconstructed image. So therefore away from this, uh, away from the boundary of the object, we can show that this uh, uh, metal artifacts belongs to the space I minus two, this conormal distribution to this line Lij, which is tangent to uh, this objects. So uh, this would be, uh, if you look at this picture, so for the Pi, you, you will get a distribution that is uh, uh, conormal to these lines. Okay, so, so now the same analysis would apply to the higher, higher order terms. For the higher order terms, you need to analyze these uh, products, uh, these polynomial terms, and uh, uh, they all belong, you know, we can find a uh, distribution space which is closed under all these operations, and then uh, you can uh, show, uh, find the, uh, get a similar result. And also in this work, in that uh, work, we also deal with the piecewise smooth boundaries. So if this is the case where you have the, like a polygon or, uh, uh, so, for example, the boundary would have a line segment which, with no, uh, which is not strictly convex, and these are not uh, uh, studied in uh, in previous works. So, uh, in this case, we can find all, we can use again use this uh, a normal and parallel function distribution to describe all the singularities R chi D and then analyze the the results. So, let me show you some pictures of the. Uh, this artifacts in different geometry. So this is this one is a, uh, kind of complicated. So you have uh, two objects. The boundaries are are not smooth, but they have these corners where they have a line segment. And in each case, we can find the all the uh, possible artifacts. So either they're tangent to two uh, strictly convex uh, uh, boundary curves, or there are uh, uh, artifacts from this corner points from this line segments. And then you can see uh, basically everything from the uh, reconstruct, you know, from the numerical simulations here. This is uh, either dark or uh, bright uh, streaking artifacts. So, and also another interesting thing is that uh, uh, when you have one strictly convex uh, object, the uh, it will not produce any uh, streaking artifacts. So this can be seen from the analysis because you would have a, uh, for example, here you you only have this term, right? So you don't have this interaction term, therefore there's no new singularity. But if, you, if your object is not, uh, does not have a smooth uh, uh, and the strictly convex boundary, like you have a corners, then only one object would produce the uh, artifacts along these lines and on, on the corners. So this is a, a cell, in, in cells paper, they had this picture, but they did not know uh, why. So and here we um, sort of explain you know, why this would happen. So now I don't have much time. So now for the, uh, now let's uh, briefly look at the result for non-convex objects. So now for the non-convex objects, so we'll, uh, if you have a non-convex objects, we'll be uh, interested uh, at the point where this uh, object is not strictly convex. So therefore, you know, I will look at the, uh, the model case of a simply connected boundary domain with smooth boundary, uh, the, uh, this gamma, and the boundary is smooth close uh, plane curve. Okay, it's a very simple uh, 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 geometric setup, but we're really interested in the case where uh, the, uh, at the point where this curve is not strictly convex. So now this will be the case of a simple inflection points. So this, uh, suppose kappa t is the curvature of the boundary curve. And this uh, simple inflection point are where the uh, curvature is zero and curvature changes sign across that point. So this is the uh, uh, 
the uh, the typical case. This is model case. Of course, you could have a uh, you know curvature zero at this point, but the curvature does not change sign. That's that will lead to another uh, um, kind of uh, degeneracy. So now locally near this uh, simple inflection point, you can choose a, a parameterization of the gamma t so that this uh, curve is parameterized in the following way. So the x1 is equal to t and x2 is t cubed times that. So uh, t times ht, which is uh, uh, we, we can assume is positive. So in particular, this curve is like a t and a t cubed. So this is a t it's like a y equal to x cubed. That's where you know, this uh, simple uh, inflection point would appear. So now in this case, Okay, so now in this case, uh, yeah, these are some assumptions to simplify the, uh, basically we will assume that there, there are only uh, uh, finite many, uh, we only have the simple inflection point because the inflection point could have higher orders. And also uh, we assume that this inf inflection point, uh, you know, there, there are not too many inflection point or interaction between the inf inflection point and other things. So now under this geometric assumption uh, in this work, uh, we prove that, um, the, all the uh, uh, the metal artifacts will be contained in lines in this uh, L, uh, in union of L and the boundary of the uh, metal objects. These lines are actually uh, either tangent at two non-inflection points or tangent at only one inflection point. So these are all the possible metal artifacts from the non-strictly convex boundary uh, so objects. So if you, uh, so this is the the picture. We only have one object here. And for this object, we have two uh, inflection point, and then we have a one line that is uh, only one straight line that is tangent to uh, this two uh, uh, streaky convex boundaries, all right, of, of this one object. So then, if you look at the uh, artifacts, so uh, according to our uh, results, you will see artifacts from this two uh, uh, non-inflection point. You can see that these are uh, weaker than the one generated from the uh, from the previous case, actually. And then uh, you have this line that is tangent to uh, to this two, uh, yeah, just like uh, what we predicted in the uh, in the result. So now the uh, so now the the interesting thing is why you have this uh, uh, why you have this uh, artifacts from the inflection point. So for, for that, we need to uh, look at uh, the singularities in this arc ID. And then uh, it, it's very interesting that we found that this uh, arc ID if, for this inflection point uh, in the, uh, the arc ID would have a cusp type singularity. So this can be computed explicitly for this model case. You assume that gamma is this case. Uh, gamma is parameterized like y to x cubed. And then uh, you denote the two pieces for x bigger than zero, less than zero. And then each piece will be mapped to a curve S plus minus on the sonogram uh, after the random transform. Uh, however, this S plus and S minus will form a cusp in the, uh, in the sonogram. And uh, the, uh, so, so now let me remind you the cusp locally, you can write the cusp in the following form x squared is equal to y cubed. And uh, so this is the, uh, the picture that you will see actually in the sonogram. So the same object here with two non-inflection, uh, uh, simple inflection point. And then in the sonogram, you get this picture here. So now we know that the, for, this, uh, for, for things in this oval, you have a transversal intersection that exactly correspond to this line that is tangent to these two boundary uh, pieces. Now, the, uh, now you can see the other two cusp point uh, this, uh, you know, there, there are two cusp points. I, I, uh, one of them is, is in, the, uh, in the square. And that cusp point corresponds to the uh, inflection point of the object. So now this uh, you know, raises some question, how do we analyze the uh, similarities in this uh, cusp point? So I think I'm running out of time now. So let me just briefly uh, go through this thing. So now the, the story is that Oh yeah, by the way, so, so now for, if you don't have the inflection point, uh, but you have the, uh, uh, for example, right? So if you have a point where the, uh, the curvature does not change sign, then you still got two curves, but those two curves will intersect tangentially, not, not uh, like transversely. So anyway, so this degeneracy in the original object will correspond to a uh, degenerous, uh, degenerated singularity in the, uh, in the sinogram. Either it's a cusp or tangent intersection, but it will not be this transversal intersection. So uh, now to, to deal with this kind of uh, 
Singularity, and uh, we we actually used uh, a lot of uh, machinery from the uh, uh, from the work of Melrose and Melrose Reader in the study of this evolution of the singularities in the solution for semi-linear wave equations. So, uh, so let me just uh, go over this thing. So, uh, yeah, um, actually, you know, for, for, for this, we used a uh, um, a larger distribution, quantum distribution space with less uh, requirement on the regularity. And uh, so let me uh, let me show you that. Um, okay, I think I'll skip this. And uh, okay, so now the uh, so the, the main thing is that uh, uh, for this uh, cusp singularity, for this uh, uh, for for, the, for this uh, cusp in the uh, in the sinogram, uh, we uh, so we start with a uh, f, which is a quantum distribution in in the space uh, here, in the space here. And then we, we can show that actually this um, RF will be a quantum will be a Lagrangian distribution associated with the cusp. However, this uh, this space here uh, defined in this way is uh, not large enough to uh, to contain all the nonlinear interactions, and therefore uh, to uh, to uh, you know to really. Uh, find the uh, located singularities, uh, this is the RF, just RF, but to find the singularities in the product, we have to go further to the, uh, to use this uh, uh, space, uh, mark Lagrange distribution space by, uh, introduced by Melrose. And then we, uh, we use another distribution space associated with the cusp to, uh, to complete the, uh, the argument. So this will be a symphony algebra that is closed under all this uh, uh, some, uh, uh, functions. And uh, one thing that we uh, actually did in the paper is that we uh, show that for you in, um, so we actually show that this space here, the smaller space is not enough because um, uh, we, we, we show, we found an example that uh, uh, you know, for distribution in here, the self-multiplication, the square will not be in this space. So basically this, this shows that actually the uh, cusp singularity will be produced. This is a, a generation of uh, singularity result. But all of this has to be done in this uh, more complicated distribution space. And uh, they're uh, actually, they're not the uh, paragonian distribution space, at least uh, before you blow up the, um, um, the cusp or the degeneracies. Okay, so uh, I think uh, you know, I'm running over time. Sorry about that. I don't know, uh, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much. Yeah.